Hello, and welcome to the Vermont PBS virtual event, How Not to Travel, But Plan Big During a Pandemic with our favorite travel expert, Rick Steves. I'm Jen Rose Smith. I'm a Vermont-based travel writer, and I'll be your host for the next hour. We would love to have your questions for Rick. Please type them in the chat box along with your first name and where you're joining us from, and we'll get to as many as we can. So without further ado, let's welcome Rick Steves to Vermont PBS. Hey, Jen, nice to be with you and all the travelers and supporters of public television right there. Just to get us kicked off, I'd love to ask you, what is a travel mindset? That's something you've written about. And I'm curious how you think we can bring a travel mindset to our lives at home right now. Yeah, it's interesting. This is the first year since I was a kid, and that was a long time ago, that I have not gone to Europe. I spend 100 days in Europe every year, and this year I've been locked down like almost everybody else. And I've been getting more media interest now that I'm not traveling than when I normally am traveling. And people are calling me up and from all sorts of magazines and shows and so on and say, well, what's it like for the travel guy to be stuck at home? And um, I've been really enjoying, to be honest, the challenge of, of, of applying my traveler's mindset right here to my community. And I find that it's really an important life skill. Uh, what marks a good traveler? A good traveler is somebody who's curious, who's eager to get out of their comfort zone and try something new, uh, to um, challenge norms, you know, that they, they thought were, were just like everybody had, but somebody else uh, try, does it differently, uh, to, to find new things to get excited about. And uh, of course, when you travel, you, you do all of that on the road, and then you come home and your life is a little broader, you have a broader perspective but you can employ that same traveler's mindset right here at home. And that's what I've been doing for the, the last six months. And um, I've been tuned into things that I never knew you could tune into. It's kind of exciting. I, I've been, no, I don't regret it, but I've been pretty lopsided with my interest. I'm so passionate about travel and my work that I've never learned how to cook. I've never really walked a dog. I've never really had a hummingbird feeder. I, I never knew in the kitchen, how important sharp knives are. And now I've, I've ventured into all of those areas, simple as they may seem, and my life is better for it. Uh, so I've been kind of traveling, kind of exploring, kind of broadening my perspective right here at home. I mean, I love to travel. I was just walking home the other day and I saw a, a snail on my neighbor's fence and all I could think was escargot. I mean, I wish I was in France eating some escargot right now, but I'm not, and I'm staying at home and uh, I'm, I'm pretty uh, uh, fortunate, I'm pretty privileged to be able to work at home and to be comfortable uh, and to uh, uh, you know, um, be healthy. And uh, it's, it's been a good year. Uh, I, I, I know that it's a challenge. It's certainly a challenge for me running a travel business. It's miserable from a business point of view, but it's beautiful from a check-in with your community point of view to it's a beautiful from a recognize the fragility of the environment point of view. It's beautiful from a make every sunset a devotional point of view. And I've been trying to keep a positive mindset and enjoying doing new, new things. I love that. And I actually love our first question from Patrick in New York City, um, which is kind of about having a travel experience at home. How would you advise bringing the holiday European market vibe indoors this December? Oh, how would you bring the, the holiday, the, like everybody goes to Germany for the Christmas markets and this sort of thing. Um, well, you know, you can, I, I had a woman on my radio show who called in and she explained she was in a part of her life where she didn't have enough money to take her children traveling. But every week they would feature a different country's cuisine and they were going right around the planet in alphabetical order and shopping and learning and cooking and eating that country's cuisine right at home. And her kids were getting quite good at geography and quite good at international cuisines and so on. Uh, you could do a little studying and you could, uh, you could have a German Christmas market night at home, that's for sure. And you could go to France and have French Christmas market night at home. Uh, the Europeans have a long holiday schedule. Um, you know, most of us in the United States, it's just one big event. But in Europe, it's, uh, it starts with some saint's day early in the season, uh, you know, early in, in uh, December. And it goes all the way till, what is it, Epiphany, the, uh, the uh, 6th of uh, January. 
when the wise men uh, brought the gifts to baby Jesus. And uh, that's a big deal in Europe is six days after the new year. Uh, so there's all of these different ways that you can bring more dimension to your holiday celebrations. You could make it uh, interfaith, you could make it international, you could have a lot of fun with that. And that's what parents are doing now is they're creatively homeschooling their kids. I think the best education you can give your kids is to take them abroad. But of course, this year, you can bring abroad home, and uh, we can do that by bringing different cultures into our families. Hopefully this winter paired with a glass of mulled wine, European Christmas market style. Um, uh, so we have another question from Nick and Kelly Hansen in Minneapolis, Minnesota. What destinations do you think are going to recover quickly after COVID and be worth a visit? Well, you know, my beat is uh, Europe. So I just do Europe. Um, and I, I employ 100 people here and Edmonds a half hour north of Seattle. And uh, we just are focusing on Europe. And the major way we earn our living and make uh, money is taking people on our bus tours around Europe. And we've decided we're not going to be the first out of the gate when it's time to go back to Europe. Uh, we're going to wait until it is solid and that it's reliable. I don't want to go through this we had 22,000 people signed up on our tours this year and we had to send them all back their, their deposits. And it was heartbreaking for so many people and so inefficient and, and just, it was an emotional mess. Uh, what we wanna do now is be patient. Uh, you know, patience is not an American forte. It's certainly not a Rick Steves forte, but lately patience is my middle name. And uh, rather than go to the first country that's available to uh, welcome guests and, and just slip in and not have to have a quarantine and not be able to cross the border and to be able to eat in a bubble in Amsterdam so I don't get somebody else's germs, I'm not gonna do that. I think once we turn the corner on this virus, it's gonna be a little, a few more months and then we'll have relative normalcy. So I would not be answering a question, where can you go first? I would think, how can I be patient and do other things. And, and, and when it is time to travel safely, then I will go where I wanna go. Um, my, as I said, my beat is Europe and we're not gonna go to Europe until all of Europe is open because if it's whack-a-mole and it's not spiking here, but it's spiking there, so I'll slip over here. That's not a, not a, a smart way to do it. We have to wait until we get a grip on the whole thing. Uh, the, Europe, Europe is, the European Union is working on that. They've got a few, um, countries in Europe that are like people in our country that refuse to embrace science and refuse to realize we have to be diligent and disciplined and work together and have good governance. Um, uh, the countries that come to mind are Poland and Hungary. Those are the countries with this um, sort of fear-mongering nationalistic kind of don't tread on me government. And uh, they're gonna be the ones that are gonna drag Europe slower, but Europe's gonna get a grip on that. And I'm thinking, people are asking me, when's travel gonna be okay again? And uh, I just had a meeting with my staff today, as a matter of fact, when are we gonna start uh, uh, opening up tours or, and so on? We're thinking the way things are going now that in August, we'll do a couple of sort of experimental tours to see what it's like. And then in September, it'll start opening up where if the vaccines take hold and so on, um, that I think we'll be able to have some travel for people who want to. And then in 2022, I think it's gonna be a pretty good year. In 2023, we're gonna be just rocking again. But I would say, I'm not even thinking about how can I get over there to Europe before everybody else. This brings up a question that I have about travel. Um, what do you think about as being the responsibility that travelers have to destinations. So when we think about going to Europe, we're thinking about being safe, but what should we also think about in terms of what we need to do for the people that we're visiting? Boy, that's a very important and a good question. Um, I think just from a person to person point of view, we're fascinating people. There's a lot of misunderstandings about America. And when we travel, it's fun to be able to share culturally, be prepared, be open to that. When you go to a pub in, in England, if you sit at a table, people don't bother you. If you sit at the bar, people bother you. They want to talk. So you can put yourself into places where people want to talk and then, you know, start up a conversation and recognize that we're just as interesting to them as they are to us. And we may be fortunate enough to be able to travel. Maybe that person doesn't have the money or the opportunity to travel. So you can bring a little bit of America with you. People are fascinated by Americans and they want to talk to us and they're confused by America. There's so much interesting stuff going on politically and so on. And when we travel, we get to straighten things out by actually sharing one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, so I would say 
it's good style to get yourself in a situation where you can share ideas. I'd also say that there is the reality that when we travel, we contribute to climate change. And Europe is far ahead of us on climate change. I think Europe, one thing about the last four years, Europe has missed American leadership. Europe wants American leadership. We can bicker and disagree, but Europe has had a taste of no leadership in, in, in the you know, highly developed and, and free world. And uh, there's, a, there's a vacuum when we're not there. So I think uh, the feeling in Europe now is America is back and that's gonna be a relief for a lot of people. Um, I think we're going to take a leadership role working with the family of nations and dealing honestly with climate change. As somebody who's in tourism, I need to pay my way. Last year, we had um, a new program called our Climate Smart Initiative. And we're not heroic by any means, but we want to mitigate the carbon we create when we travel. If an American flies from Vermont to Europe and back, they add carbon to the atmosphere. And if you believe in climate change, that's warming up the planet. Now, should you not travel? Well, that's one option. I think you should travel if you wanna travel, but recognize that you can mitigate the carbon that you contribute by investing in certain things that make the climate um, more calm. And you can buy carbon offsets, but what I would rather do is invest in what's called climate smart agriculture in the developing world. And that's what we've done. And experts know, experts in this, scientists know that if you smartly invest $30 in third world farmers, developing world farmers, uh, enabling them to do their work while contributing less to climate change, you save as much carbon as you contribute when you fly to Europe and back, thereby you know, zeroing out the carbon that you create and then you are flying carbon neutral. Uh, as a tour company, I took 30,000 people to Europe in 2019 and uh, I made more money than I should have made. I should have been taxed for the carbon that we created to do our business. That's a cost of doing good, uh, cost of uh, business, uh, a cost of goods sold that I should have been taxed on. I believe just because I'm an ethical businessman that believes that we should be responsible for the impact on the environment when we make money. So I gave myself a self-imposed carbon tax of thirty dollars per customer, and that's thirty thousand people. Thirty dollars. That's nine hundred thousand dollars. I rounded it up to a million dollars and we created a, a little organization called the Rick Steves Climate Smart Initiative. And we invested in 10 organizations helping farmers in the developing world do their work while contributing less to climate change and less to deforestation and so on. And right now we've just reviewed the impact of our money, our investment, and we're thrilled with what we were able to do with that self-imposed carbon tax. I wish our government just made me pay that tax, but it didn't. And I'm not just gonna take that money. It's ethical for me to cover my costs to the climate. So this year we took nobody to Europe. Nobody times 30 is zero, uh, but we decided we're so excited about what we've accomplished so far that we're gonna do a half, 50% of what we would have done in a good year. So we are investing half a million dollars in 10 organizations to do more of the same work. Uh, I've got this program on my website and right in the top, it says, please steal this program and don't credit me. Just find a way with different tour companies around the United States to do your travel business in a way that is carbon neutral. It's not going to break the bank if you're a successful tour company and you should be paying your way. So I think that's really important. And that's a long-winded answer to a simple question about how can we help people when we travel. So you talk a lot about meaningful travel in your great book, Travel is a Political Act, which I love. And one of our viewers has a question about meaningful travel. She says, I would love to hear about meaningful travel with children aged 10 to 14 years old when you have a limited budget. So if budget only allows for travel every few years, what are you thinking? Boy, it is such an exciting thing in, in regards to parenting to be able to take your kids to Europe. I was so thankful that we were able to bring our kids to Europe every year. I was working in Europe. So my wife and kids flew over for part of my travels and we took them out of school every April uh, for two or three weeks. And the teachers always felt that um, they were learning more over there with all the stimulation you get when you're on the road, as long as parents are overseeing it and making sure the kids are you know, just being a little bit uh, uh, focused on education. Uh, it's such a great opportunity to take kids abroad. I mean, everywhere you turn, there are new things and new ways to stimulate yourself. And I remember for me on my very first trip, I was 14 years old, ninth grade. 
and I went to Norway to see the relatives. And I was there uh, in 1969 on the day Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And I remember sitting on the carpet in front of my Norwegian, uh, with my Norwegian cousins, listening to the moonwalk being broadcast in Norwegian. And leap to skritta for a man skatrin and a giant leap for mankind. And it was so fun, even as a ninth, ninth grade kid, to recognize that back home, everybody was waving their American flags and going, yay, we did it. Uh, you know, but the whole world was watching and celebrating. And for me, as just an ethnocentric, egocentric 14-year-old, that was a great opportunity to broaden my perspective because I was in Norway during that time and I was paying attention and my parents were probably reminding me of things. But so many times when I think back on it, these little Eurekas that hit me when I was a, a little kid in Europe because my parents brought me over there uh, had a huge impact on who I ultimately became. You know, I, I've just been thinking a lot about this sort lately and, you know, culture shock. Uh, if you can artfully, inflict culture shock on a loved one. It's the growing pains of a broadening perspective. It's a beautiful thing, culture shock. And as a tour guide, I work with my guides and you know, we, we don't want just to give people fun in the sun on the beach, that's part of it. But we want to get people out of their comfort zones and we want them to have a transformational experience. And you mentioned my book, uh, Travel as a Political Act. I think I just happen to have a copy right here. But this is the book that I just think is one of the most important of the 50 books that I've written, because this explains what is the most valuable thing about travel. Traveling in a way where we get an empathy for the other 96% of humanity. And we fly home with what I think is the most beautiful souvenir. And that's a broader perspective. I've studied this a lot lately. And of course we have our tour program and my TV shows and my guidebooks and all this. And I'm so tuned in that you can travel in a way where you don't go home with a broader perspective, or you can travel in a way where you honestly become a citizen of the planet, as well as more thankful that you're an American probably. And that's a beautiful thing. That is the most valuable souvenir. And it really is determined in so many ways by the attitude that you pack along. And there is a follow-up question to that. So when you're thinking about traveling with children for that kind of perspective broadening experience, is there an ideal number of days to stay in a place? Is there a minimum number of days that you think people really need to take it in? Well, there's, a, there's just a practicality of it. It takes a day or two to get over jet lag and it takes a day to get there and a day to get back. And I just think it's expensive and not very efficient to go over just for a week because you spend a lot of time in route and you spend a lot of time not quite 100% because you're dealing with jet lag. Uh, two weeks, I would say is a good minimum. I mean, if you only have 10 days, that's fine. You know, enjoy your 10 days, but two weeks is, is great. Three weeks is long. I like it, but you got to be realistic about your energy level. How long can you be intensely absorbing in your travels? Uh, when I first did my tour program, we only did 22 day itineraries. Everything was 22 days. I was on a one man crusade to help Americans have a longer vacation. You know, we have the shortest vacations in the rich world here in the United States. And I wanted to change that. And my staff said, Rick, give it up. If you want to grow this tour program, you got to accommodate the short American vacation and we have to offer shorter tours. So now our best selling tours are 10 or 12 days. And we have a few seven day tours and our longest tour is 20 days. Um, but I'd say two weeks is ideal, uh, Jen. And uh, if you can go three weeks, that's, I love that. Uh, before committing yourself to a real long trip, be realistic about your endurance if you haven't traveled a lot. And also I think it's very important to moderate culture shock rather than flying right into Turkey. I think you should start mild and work into the more challenging and exotic corners. Fly to England first, which is relatively mild. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love England, but go there first when cream teas and roundabouts are exotic. Then go to France, then go to Italy, and then finish thing off with a flurry in uh, Greece and Turkey and fly home from Istanbul. That'd be a great trip. But if you flew first into Istanbul, even if you survived Istanbul, by the time you got back to London, it'd be anticlimactic. So start mild, work to exotic or be more patient and just do this first. And then a couple of years later, you'll do that. And a couple of years later, you'll do that. That's a big question people have to deal with. So another viewer question is, what suggestions do you have for planning a trip kind of as a way to deal with pandemic stress if you can't make reservations or concrete plans? What are you thinking about when it comes to planning future adventures? Oh, well, don't try to make reservations. Don't, don't bog down on that. Just get excited about 
destinations, get excited about cultures, um, learn. There's so much you can enjoy, just uh, great stuff on TV, great books to read, great lectures. Um, I, I just, uh, and then you, 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 you pack up all these things you want to do. I've been going to Europe for 100 days a year ever since I was a kid now. 40 years ago, I wrote my first book. And uh, I was just in Europe for 100 days in 2019. And I was finding place things and dimensions of Europe that I never even considered seriously. Uh, we were in, we were, we just uh, were filming a three week series on the Alps, which is so exciting. It was, and it's airing all over the country. I, I think it's airing on Vermont PBS now. And it's our new season 11, eight weeks, eight shows, eight episodes. And uh, we did three Alps episodes. And um, I was doing the French Alps. And I met a woman who I interviewed on my radio show. And uh, she wrote the book for long distance walks in Europe. So I asked her to join us in, in Chamonix and she took us hiking around Mount Blanc. It's a hundred mile, 10 day hike. We just did two days pretending like we we're doing the whole thing with the TV crew. But I didn't even realize that there's this whole culture in European travel of long distance hike going from mountain lodge to mountain lodge to mountain lodge, all reserved in advance. Every night comes with dinner. You don't have a choice. You eat whatever's cooking. Every morning, a van comes and you toss your bag in the van and the van drops your bag at the next lodge. And then you walk footloose and fancy free with new friends from around the world as you go through Italy, France, and Switzerland in 10 days hiking around Mont Blanc. And I was just in that culture for two days filming it. And I just thought, oh, baby, I, I never even realized this was an option. And if I had a chance to go to Europe on vacation, that might be something I would like to do for 10 days. But it took me 40 years to find that. There's so much that we can do just when we think about going back to Europe, but we gotta, gotta know that there's a lot of options. So here's a question from Michigan that touches on that same region we were just discussing. Um, Rick, I wanna take my husband to Switzerland in a few years. What is your favorite thing in Switzerland? Something that you experience and will never ever forget. Oh yeah. Walking on a ridge, high above the valley. It's like literally tight roping on a ridge. A trail right on a ridge. On one side, I've got lakes stretching all the way to Germany. On the other side, I've got the most incredible alpine panorama anywhere, the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. And ahead of me, I hear the long legato tones of an Alphorn announcing that the helicopter stocked mountain hut is open. It's just around the corner and the coffee schnapps is on just to be walking like that and healthy and exercising and breathing in the fresh air and saying, you know, Gritzi or Grusgat or Guten Tag or uh, Bonjour to everybody who walks by and then drop into that mountain hut a little bit further down. That's from uh, Schinnegeplatt past Foulhorn to a place called First above Interlaken in the Bernice Oberland in Switzerland. By the way, in just a couple of hours, I'm gonna be uh, hosting an event I do where I stream my brand new show. It's called Monday Night Travels. And we just started this last week, but every Monday night to help people get through this COVID time, I'm gonna be hosting an event uh, that's streaming and a behind the scenes look at our TV shows. And the show tonight happens to be the best of the Swiss Alps that we just filmed in 2019, last year. And it's, gonna, it's just gonna be a fun show. There's seats available, it's free. And if you just go to ricksteves.com and, and look for Monday Night Travel, you can, uh, you can log on and be there tonight. Or you can watch it on my Facebook page because we post the event tomorrow and then it'll be on there forever. Um, but Switzerland, I just love, love, love Switzerland. It's got so many different dimensions. We did one TV show that was only the big cities of Switzerland, no mountains at all. And it was wonderful. Uh, but of course, the real attraction for most of us is getting up into the mountains. And in so many ways, the, the most vivid traditional culture survives in the high corners. So it's like they're, they're, they're escaping the ravages of the modern world and they're just hunkering down way in the high villages. And to go up there and to be able to spend a few days up there, there's nothing like it, it's great. That sounds wonderful for people like me who are feeling a little travel starved at this point in the pandemic. But you actually also have another hour long special coming out, Hunger and Hope in February, which I'm excited about. And that took you to Guatemala and Ethiopia to learn about poverty. And I know we really associate you with Europe, um, like the United States, that's a wealthy place. What prompted you to visit these countries to do this special? 
Well, thanks for asking, Jen. And for years, well, for 30 years, every two years, I've been bringing out a new series for public television with a dozen or so new episodes, cutting Europe into half hour slices. And these are travelogues. And that's what I was talking about with the Swiss Alps show. And, you know, it's a part of three shows. There's the Italian and, and uh, Austrian Alps, there's the Swiss Alps, and then next week is the French Alps. So that's my routine. But uh, for the last decade or longer, I have been taking uh, topics that I think are really important that caring, smart Americans should know better. And I've been studying it as a traveler and putting together a one hour documentary on that topic and then bringing it home and thanks to public television being able to air it. We've done uh, Iran, we've done the Holy Land, we did Martin Luther and the Reformation. We've done the great festivals of Europe. We've been celebrating Christmas and countries all over Europe, celebrating Eastern countries all over Europe and uh, cruising and uh, cruising the Mediterranean. And uh, just last year, it's a show I've wanted to do for ages. It's a show that looks at the fundamentals of poverty and hunger and why is there hunger in, in a world with such abundance. I did a show like this in Papua New Guinea with my church, with the Lutheran church, um, 25 years ago, but I've always wanted to do it for secular media in a more serious one hour uh, sort of program. And this was the time to do it. So we did, we went to Ethiopia and we went to Guatemala. I scouted it first and then went back with our crew. And I've been studying this for uh, many trips. I've done many trips to Central America and to places in the developing world with an interest in what are the, what, what is structural poverty? What keeps people down? And the theme for this show was also how is modern development aid a, a practical investment? Because without um, you know telling the moral of the story, you got to watch the show. But uh, what I kind of conclude is you can care about hungry people and defeating poverty because you want to love your neighbor, or you can do it for more selfish reasons that you just want a more stable world and a safer world. It's okay either way or a little mix of both, but we can make a huge difference. Uh, with the power that we have in America, if we can uh, continue to invest in smart development aid. And a lot of development aid, a lot of people, a lot of good people tend to be cynical about development aid because of old fashioned development aid. But new development aid is really impressive. It's so practical, it's so effective. And, uh, you know, extreme poverty, that's people living on $2 a day. It was on a trajectory to be gone. We had, we had dropped it from uh, by more than 50% in one generation, from 2 billion down to 700 million people. That's 10% of humanity. And just in the last few years, it's, it's ticked up because of climate change, conflict, corruption, and now because of COVID, the four Cs, you know. Um, but uh, I wanted to make a show to give people a, a little better understanding of that. It was a wonderful challenge. I'm, I'm really proud of the show. I'm so thankful that public television can air it. And I think Vermont's going to air it in February. And uh, it's available uh, streaming online before that if you really want to get it right now. But uh, uh, I'm, again, I'm thankful that public television is a, is, a, is a place in the media landscape where we can assume an attention span, respect people's intelligence, and make programming driven not by a passion for keeping advertisers happy, that's the norm everywhere else on the dial, but that's driven just by a passion for equipping and educating and inspiring all of us caring people to embrace the world in all its beautiful diversity. It's a beautiful thing. And I'm getting myself into a pledge drive right now, so I'll stop because I know people who are watching are already supporting Vermont PBS, but it's just something we need to be mindful of. Media is huge in shaping our outlook especially in this day and age when truth is optional. And uh, it's so important that we support media. It threatens a lot of people who would rather us all just be dumbed down, mindless producer consumers. But this is that little oasis on the dial that, that, that challenges us to be engaged. And uh, as a traveler and a tour guide and somebody who really is thankful for what I've learned on the road, it's so great to be able to bring it home. And, and I think maybe the most gratifying show I've ever done in, in 30 years on public television is this show you just mentioned, uh, Hunger and Hope, Lessons Learned in Ethiopia and Guatemala. Well, I really look forward to watching it. Um, in the meantime, we have another really good question from a viewer. This is from Shannon who says, I know in the last few years there have been increased concern of overcrowding in certain destinations such as Venice and Paris. Have countries taken this pause to reevaluate the negative impact to over tourism? Or when travel starts up, is it going to be back to normal? You know, 
there's so many good concerns that are just bulldozed by by money and you know we it's just money uh economies need the money of tourism they want us we butter the bread there uh it's just like the way we consume here in the united states so many of us we say we care about this but when push comes to shove we consume over here because it's more convenient or less expensive uh in europe um you know, there's there's issues that that are a problem. There's just too many people traveling, and uh, that was a problem a year ago. It's not a problem now, that's for sure, and it, it's going to be moderated when we come out of this COVID time because I think the economy will be a little tight. But the big big challenge in 2019, when I was just last researching, is not only all the Europeans who are traveling and all the Americans who are traveling, but people from emerging economies who are traveling. People in India and China, those are countries with a billion people. And they've got a million, a, a middle class of uh, 200 million people. And they've all got enough money to go to Europe if they want to. Um, they're coming to Europe in huge numbers. And it's exciting. I'm so thankful that people from formerly poor countries can travel. But it really has an impact on Europe. And uh, we all tend to go to the same places. That's a, that's a, a big problem, Jen, is just everybody wants to go to the famous places. And with this Instagram mentality that we've got now, it's just mindless. Everybody's going to these odd little spots. Why? Because you're supposed to stand right here and get a selfie. They don't even know the name of the town, you know? And uh, so there's a lot of that mindless crowd mass production, just stampeding kind of tourism. And uh, yeah, there are, there are overcrowded places in Europe that were starting to get gnarly and negative about tourism. I mean, Amsterdam, Barcelona, uh, Venice, Florence, local people were feeling like their hometown has been stolen from them. Of course, they're making a lot of money off it. Do they really want to get rid of the money uh, that comes with tourism? Well, it's an uh, awkward situation they got themselves into. But as a tourist, remember, you can choose where you want to go and you could avoid all those places and have a wonderful time. There's plenty, 90% of Europe does not have tourist crowds. And you could take away all the places that have tourist crowds and still have great stuff to do in Europe. So every tourist, every traveler has to decide what, what angle do they want to take when they go to Europe. So we've got a question that's kind of from the hometown crowd. Have you ever visited Vermont? And I'm going to add to that. If you have visited Vermont, any special memories or things you love there? I should have a better answer for that. I'm pathetic when it comes to exploring the United States. I have come through uh, the Northeast several times on road trips visiting towns and giving talks at stations. But when I'm on the road in the United States, I'm usually going straight to a public television station and giving a talk and uh, you know, going on the next day to the next, uh, next state. Um, I come also, I've come to Vermont to help legalize marijuana. And I was very impressed with my visit then. Um, uh, I really enjoyed meeting your local politicians and your state senators and so on. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of progressive and smart thinking there when it comes to drug policy reform. Uh, and, but every time I do go to New England, uh, I just feel like, wow, this country is a place I'd like to explore more. But I'm a workaholic. I've found my niche. I employ 100 people. My publisher was just bragging last year that of the 30 top American produced guidebooks to Europe, 25 of them have Rick Steves on the cover. And I take that as a huge responsibility. And I, if somebody said I can have a wonderful vacation on the East Coast of the United States, or I can go to Europe and update my material. I think I'd go back to Europe and update my material for now. So going back to Europe, we have a question from Michelle who says, what question, what countries or areas would you suggest to a solo traveler wanting to see as much of Europe as possible? Maybe in like three weeks, like you suggested. What countries would I suggest? Yeah. Well, if you want to see as much as Europe as possible, it's good you're going alone because then you don't have to ask questions and you can go fast and see that and on to something else and so on. You can turn on a dime. I would do some studying and I would, uh, I would make reservations for uh, the hotels. And then I would also reserve local guides and admissions to sites. We're talking at norm when normal times come back now after COVID uh, because everybody again wants to go to the same places. So when you go to Florence, there's plenty of great art, but you want to see Michelangelo's David. And you want to see the Uffizi gallery for the Botticelli paintings and so on. And you'll need to make that reservation in advance. When you go to Rome, uh, you want to reserve the Vatican Museum in advance. You want to receive the Colosseum, re reserve the Colosseum in advance. And you want to reserve the Villa Borghese to see the Bernini statues in advance. So you will be able to accomplish a lot more 
if you make your reservations for your hotels and your sightseeing and your local private guides in advance. And then I think you'll want to take the train instead of driving. It's much more efficient to take the train. The train is fantastic. You're in Salzburg, you have a great time and half an hour before your train departs, you check out of your hotel, you walk over to the train station, sit on the train an hour and a half later, you're in Vienna and they have a great time there. And then, you know, three days later, you're gonna leave and you get on the train and, and an hour later, you're in Budapest. And, and then five hours after that, you're in Prague and then you go up to Berlin. And it's amazing how, how comfortable it is to travel by train. Um, so I really like that idea. And uh, you can do a lot if you're well organized uh, with a given amount of time. It's people seem to be a little embarrassed to say how fast they're going, but it's an American style of travel. Of course, you can go too fast where you hardly know where you are. And that's ridiculous. So you got to be realistic about you're not just checking off boxes, but you're staying put long enough to learn something and have an experience. One standard I would have when you're making a fast and demanding itinerary is all try to minimize one night stops. You want two nights at a minimum. Uh, you know, you're, you're disoriented and just brand new at things the first night. And the second night, you're really much more comfortable and it just feels good. So even at the expense of a grueling long day, I would gather your overnight stops at least two nights in a row per stop. Also remember, flying in Europe used to be so expensive, nobody did it who was on a budget or spending their own money. Now, flying in regular times, apart from COVID, is uh, deregulated and quite inexpensive. And you can fly, in a lot of cases, cheaper than you can take the train. So fly when you can. And I fly a lot in Europe from point to point. I arrange those tickets before I leave home. And, uh, you know, it's just an hour flight from Stockholm to Oslo. And there are bullet trains that go from downtown Stockholm every 15 minutes, 100 miles an hour, right out to the airport. And it's super slick and super modern. And part of the joy of traveling in Europe is just experiencing the infrastructure of Europe, the bullet trains. I was on a train going across France a few years ago, and I noticed the speedometer was only um, illuminated when the train was going more than 300 kilometers an hour. 300 kilometers. Cut it in half and add 10%. That's how many miles it is. 300, 150 plus 30, 180 miles an hour. Uh, it was smooth. It was silent. Uh, there's beautiful pastoral scenery out the window, and then bam, you're in Paris. And I just thought, Part of the joy of being here is having experienced this futuristic bullet train. So uh, you can travel a lot and you can travel fast in Europe, but you'll want to get your ducks in a row before you leave home. So in that three week trip you described where you're covering a lot of cultures, a lot of cuisines, a lot of ways of just interacting with people, you're going to encounter all kinds of different things. And you've talked about when traveling that you should, if you find something that's not to your liking, change your liking. And I'm wondering what that means to you and what that means to travelers and why we should change our liking if we encounter something that's not for us. Well, you're gonna be in Portugal and you don't, you're, you're gonna, you're inclined to order your favorite drink um, from home, but you realize that's gonna limit what bar you can go to and you're gonna pay more for it, and you're not gonna impress anybody because they don't know how to do it right, and they're kind of disappointed you're not gonna try the local drink. Um, the attitude is, I wanna become a temporary local. I wanna be like a cultural chameleon. When I'm in Portugal, I, ha I eat barnacles, and because they're very top end and for, for a little munchies when you're in a bar, and I drink green, what's called vino verde, green wine. Um, when I'm in England, I have a spot of tea. I don't think I've ever made tea in this hemisphere. I just don't get tea in my normal life. But when I'm in England, I'm in this mindset where I am a cultural chameleon and a spot of tea just really feels good in England. When I'm in Scotland, I have whiskey. It's, 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 it's just so local to have a little flask of whiskey and you have a weed ram every night. I don't think I've ever ordered a beer in Tuscany. I always have a Corposo Vino Rosso, a full body glass of red wine because uh, that's the forte there. And I don't think I've ever had a glass of wine in Prague because they've got the best beer in the world in Prague. Uh, so, you know, I, a lot of people say, oh, chocolate to die for, that's baloney, unless you're in Belgium and then chocolate really is good. And that's where I go to the fanciest chocolateria and I, I, I go to the gourmet place and I spend money to get the very best stuff. And it's part of my style. Uh, it's funny because a lot of times I buy something to bring home, a, a, a bottle of ouzo after I had a great experience with ouzo uh, in Greece. And I get home and I go, why would I drink ouzo here? I just don't want to drink ouzo in Seattle. But when I'm in Greece, I don't let a day go by without enjoying a nice cloudy glass of ouzo. 
So it's this it become a temporary local. So it just serves us well if uh, to like what is what the locals like. If it's not to your liking, change your liking. Uh, that, that actual phrase came out of my tour guiding days because I would take groups on the same route. And even back when I was just driving a minibus and I'd have eight people, it was quite an intimate affair. Eight people on a minibus would be driving, rugged travel, staying in youth hostels, picnicking together, you know, really uh, having a sort of a backpacker adventure in a cooperative way. And I'd come into one youth hostel on one trip and everybody was just having a great time with the locals and the hardships and the unpredictability and the, the strangeness of it. And then three weeks later, I'd come into the same youth hostel with the same situation with a different group of people. And they were miserable because they had a different attitude about that same opportunity to, if it's not to your liking, change your liking. And it occurred to me that really makes a big difference. Once I came into my favorite youth hostel, no, it wasn't a hostel, it was Walter's Hotel, just a chalet hotel in Gimmelwald, my favorite little village high in the Alps. And I came into Walter's just blitzing around as I do when I'm researching my book. And there was an American woman who was a Girl Scout leader or something like this, or a choir director or something like that. And they had a group traveling around together. And, oh, Rick Steves is here, you know? So I went into the dining hall and they all wanted to get a picture and I said hi to them. And, and then the teacher goes, girls, if it's not to your liking, and then in unison, they all said, change your liking. And that was her mantra when they were traveling around Europe and it served them well too. I love that. Um, so shifting away from culture and more towards nature, here's a question from a viewer who says, I love culture, but also travel with a strong nature lens. I love to get away from people and take in scenic natural beauty. What's the wildest European country or area you've been to? Well, I Iceland is amazing. Iceland, it's got a, a surprisingly interesting culture um, and it mixes so beautifully with nature. Uh, I mean, but Iceland is just dramatic. Uh, this is, Iceland is where Europe and America come together. Geologically speaking, it is on the fault. You hear about the volcanoes in Iceland. That's because the big tectonic plate of Europe and the big tectonic plate of America, that's where they rub. And even in the old Viking days, the, they would all, all the, the warlords would gather at this one spot where there's this rip in the world. And this is, it, this gorge is where the two tectonic plates are coming and separating and so on. And that's where they would come and, and, and celebrate the fact that they were all Icelanders and they would have their, their, their giant gathering. Um, but I just, in so many ways, Iceland takes your breath away from a nature point of view. Uh, you get the same in Norway to a certain degree. Uh, of course, the Swiss Alps, uh, uh, but there's, you know, Again, the more I travel, the more I realize there's, you can never exhaust Europe of what it has to offer. I remember I was traveling for decades before I knew what Plitvice National Park was in uh, Croatia. And Plitvice National Park, it's, an, it's, a grand, it's, a, it's a national park in that country. And if you can imagine the Grand Canyon, but lushly vegetated with, with 100 lakes, all terraced, and then connected by countless waterfalls. That's kind of like Plitvice. And it's now got boardwalks where you can hike around there on these boardwalks and you're getting the spray from the waterfalls and you're walking behind the waterfalls and, and you're doing it with a bunch of people from Croatia and Serbia. And uh, I just thought, wow, this is really cool. And I didn't even know it existed until I finally went there. Uh, so you get these, you know, you can be on the far west of Ireland where it's just really ruddy. And people say there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. And you can stand at that bluff and gaze out at the Atlantic with the little old Irishman that's standing there next to you. And he'll say, uh, the next parish over is Boston. And there's these wonderful little moments you have, appreciating nature, sharing nature with the local people. Uh, it's just, you just got to love it. Uh, but you don't get it when you sit in your hotel room or your B&B &B and wait for the weather to get good. You got to get out there and face the weather and, and, and make it happen. So speaking of weather, we have a question from Jared who says he's in rainy Vancouver, Canada and wonders what books would you recommend for armchair travelers to experience the world while we're all locked down? Hmm. Well, Jared, I'm sorry, but that is just too good of an opening for me not to make a little mention of my newest book because this is called For the Love of Europe. And I wrote this last year. I locked myself down last year, not knowing we would all be locked down this year in order to write this 400 page collection of my favorite, very favorite articles that I've ever written. 
And these are my 400 or my 100 favorite experiences in Europe in 400 pages. And I swept through this book because I'm sort of wired to give all sorts of practical tips. I pulled out all the practical tips. This is just the magic, the pithy magic of travel. And um, I'm so thankful that I wrote it last year because it's perfect reading for when all of us travelers are locked down because this is a daily dose of European travel charm and wonder and history and magic for a hundred days in a row. But that's, that's my contribution in that regard. Um, there's a lot of good travel writing and also good travel video that people can watch. And um, I'm this, the um, tough thing for me is I'm not that well read because I've written 50 or 60 books and I'm just always working on my own books. So I'd love to go on a reading vacation and just read more. But when I do find good travel literature, it's a, obviously it's a way to travel and, and never leave your, your armchair. So much of that magic that you're describing is about people. And Wes and Laura in Lancaster, Ohio have this question. You've mentioned interacting with the locals. How do you get over the language barrier? If I recall, you don't fluently speak many other languages. Right. You know, it's so interesting because I was just talking about the, the book I just wrote. And uh, I think here you can see the essence of good travel is people and uh, connecting with people. And, oh, it's connecting with people. When you think about what really gives you those vivid memories. I mean, if I'm making a TV show, if I am working on one of our guided tours, if I'm writing a guidebook, if I'm taking my family on vacation, the whole thing is based on people to people. That's what carbonates the experience. How do you meet these people? Some people are natural extroverts. They meet people everywhere they go and they've got a huge advantage, I gotta say. Um, other people are just good at on when they're on the road, connecting with people. You can be in a on a train and share your food. You can uh, take a walking tour in London and finish it uh, and be friends with three or four people and go out for a drink. Uh, you can uh, 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 there, there's just so many ways you can connect with people, uh, but you got to make a point to do it. If you're not meeting people, either other travelers, which is fine or locals. If you're not meeting people, you're, you're just missing the boat. Uh, I speak only English. That's a disadvantage. Uh, I brag about it, it seems like, because not because I'm proud of it, it's a shame I speak only English, but it, it legitimizes what I say that you don't need to speak the language to enjoy Estonia or Greece or Finland or, or Italy. Um, we speak the world's linguistic common denominator. We, we speak the language that works. Counterintuitively, it's the little countries where the language barrier is the least. Norway, Estonia, Portugal, that's where you've got a very small, well, not Portugal so much, but Estonia and Norway and places like that, Hungary. You've got a very small world. There's only, what, 10 million people that'll speak uh, Hungarian or or Norwegian or, or Finnish in the whole world. And if you're gonna learn a second language, it's gonna make your world bigger. And what second language are you gonna choose? It's not gonna be Estonian, it's gonna be English. And uh, so I've been saying this ever since, well, for 30 years of lecturing. And since then a whole generation has grown up speaking better English than ever. ever. But when you travel, you realize people who are well-educated, people who are young, people who are in tourism, they're very likely to speak English. So I would say, rather than learn another language, you'll do better if you just think about how to communicate in simple English. So people who learned, who don't speak fluently can understand you better. And also it's very important just from a cultural sense and sensitivity point of view to know the polite words when you're in a new country. Learn, have a little vocabulary of 20 words that, that will always get you smiles and, and better service and, and uh, let people know you respect their culture. But we, we're lucky that we can be monoglots and get away with it. But find a way to meet the people. Um, it looks like on my TV show that I've got friends everywhere I go in Europe. I'm really lucky. Uh, I'm always introducing these people. Here's my friend and fellow tour guide, so-and-so. Uh, but actually, I'm just paying them to be my friends. You know, uh, you can all buy, hire a guide. And the guides, the guides are very charming. And they're quite reasonable. And you can hire a guide for half a day. And you've got a friend in, 
in, in uh, Lisbon. You've got a friend in Barcelona. You've got a friend in Thessalonica. You've got a friend in, in uh, Budapest. You've got a friend in Dubrovnik. It's easy to get a guide for Montenegro for a day. I mean, rent a guide for a day in Dubrovnik and go on a road trip up into Montenegro with a, your own local guide who speaks English that you hired. Um, it's a, it's a, if you can afford it, it, it's one of the best splurges you can do in Europe from a practical point of view. And do you have any advice on hiring good local guides? How do you know you're getting the real deal? That's an important decision because you're stuck with the guide once you hire them and it's expensive, especially if you waste a day in $400 or something like that. Guides generally ch charge, you know, two or $300 for half a day and $400 for a full day. Uh, it's more expensive in richer countries like England and it's less expensive in poorer countries like Bulgaria or Turkey or Morocco or Portugal. Um, I work very hard to collect guides. So, you know, if people use any of my books, if I've ever used a guide, if they're any good, I put them in the book with their email address so people can email them directly and get that guide. When I go to Europe for 100 days, I'm probably on my own updating my guidebooks for a third of that time, 35 days. I'm working on my bus tour program for 35 days, and I'm making TV shows for 35 days. Probably every one of those days that I'm working on my guidebooks, I've got a local guide. And I find them through the tourist board. I find them through um, just Googling uh, local guides. I find them through other guidebooks, or if I've been there before, I, I look at my own guidebook and see what it is. Uh, but you do need to make sure the guide is, is um, your style. Let's just put it that way. It, wouldn't, it would probably even be worth getting on the phone and talking to them for a few minutes just to see if you, you like their style. Because there's a lot of guides that just phone it in. And they've, been doing, they've got seniority, they play the game, and they're recommended by the tourist board. And they really are boring and not very good. And other guides are the most inspirational people you could, you could ever bump into. One of the big joys in my work is just the guides that I get to work with with my tour program. I'm sitting in a very quiet house right now, but last January, I had a hundred of our guides packing my living room right here. We fly our guides in from all over Europe every January for our big week-long brainstorming session when we have our guide summit. And when I get all these guides together here, the energy is just incredible because a guide is just passionate about his or her culture. They got so much to teach. They've got so much energy. They've got so much creativity. It's just give me a bus and 25 Americans and a microphone and I'm going to just blow them away. You know, you can tap into that. And that's the, the big, the real fun for me in my work as a tour organizer. When I started doing my tours, I just could not imagine anybody but Rick Steves doing a Rick Steves tour. Now, I get a lot of people to say, I want to go on one of your tours, but I want you for the guide. And I say, you don't want me for the guide. You know, I'm the generalist. I honestly would rather have any of my guides in their area of specialty. And that's just a beautiful thing. So one way or another, try to tap into those guides. I do have a situation. It's a difficult situation for guides right now. It's a difficult situation for tour organizers like me um, because nobody's traveling and I got a payroll of 100 people and that's difficult with no revenue. But that's not even counting all of my guides that are in Europe, my freelancers, and they've got no work at all right now. Uh, when we do come out of this COVID time, uh, it'll, there'll be an interim period where there will be people traveling safely, but there won't be organized travel. There won't be bus tours yet. And the, my challenge is just because I care about my travelers and my guides, I want to use my wherewithal to connect them without making any money. So I'm turning my tour sales page at ricksteves.com into a guides marketplace. It's there right now with 50 guides sharing all the things they're doing online, virtual travel experiences, language lessons, uh, cooking lessons, uh, history lessons, you name it, all virtual tours, lots of fun, creative things they're doing. Uh, and it's a cool uh, opportunity to get people together that a lot of people are enjoying. And I've noticed during this difficult time, our guides, and they're really shut down in Europe. When they're shut down, they are shut down, you know? And when they can get out, they're just like, like, let out of a cage really with for the world but the time will come when people are going to europe and they won't have bus tours to take but they can take the money they would spend on a bus tour and just hire a direct a guide directly and have them meet you at the hotel and what i want to do is be the conduit for that to help travelers that want the local guidance connect with an expert local guide who does rick steves in normal rick steves tours in normal times but during abnormal times can work one-on-one -on -one with those travelers and we'll be doing that with the guides marketplace at ricksteves.com 
And would you also tell us a little bit more about the Rixdews Volunteer Corps? I know that's something you've been working on since the pandemic, and I'm curious how it came to be and what they're doing right now. Thank you, Jen. I, I do a lot of things to try to uh, just be a good local business uh, citizen. I mean, uh, uh, business leaders in the community need to, I think, um, recognize that we got to take care of our communities. Our communities don't happen without good local citizenry. And um, I'm in a situation where I'm committed to keeping my team together. I just think I've had 30 years of good years where I've profited off my staff, and now I'm going to have a couple of bad years. And uh, I need to take the good years with the bad years. So it's an ethical thing for me to do, to trim the sails a little bit. We're all working three and a half or four days a week instead of five days a week. And um, I'm still providing everybody with health care. But I'm, I'm uh, uh, what do you call it, a pr privately held company instead of publicly held. So I didn't, you know, I, I haven't dispersed all the money to stockholders. And I'm able to take some big losses for two years to keep my staff together. Uh, I'm paying them to work, but there's not enough work to keep all of my departments busy because nobody's traveling to Europe right now. And I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of need in our community. So what I can do is I can open up an opportunity for my staff who's getting paid and doesn't have stuff to do at their desk to take that paid time and work in different organizations that keep our community together during this difficult time. And I do it in a way that I try to inspire other companies that are in a similar situation to do it also. It's, this is an entrepreneurial mindset that I, I enjoy exercising. And we're helping with, we're, you know, out of 100 people, we're, our goal is to have 20, the equivalent of 20 full-time people out of the 100, 20% of our workforce divided between all 100 in different ways to be doing volunteer work in our community. So we're delivering meals to seniors who are shut in, Meals on Wheels. We're helping uh, organize and fund and, and stock the local food banks. We are manning the thrift store that helps raise money for our senior center. We're working for our city government to pull weeds in our invasive weeds in our city parks and keep the parks clean for people. And it's just such a fun, beautiful thing to do and my staff's enjoying it. And we're inspiring other people to pitch in and help out in our community as well. One thing we got to remember is some of us are privileged and able to work from home and healthy and uh, just get kind of waltz right through this. But there's a lot of darkness and a lot of desperation and a lot of fear out there. And understandably so, this is a very difficult time. And it's uh, important for everybody to recognize more important than my business and my vacation is keeping our community together. So I just want to be a good local citizen. And that's what the Rick Steves Volunteer Corps is all about. And uh, it's fun to do that and hopefully inspire other business leaders to do something similar to take care of their community. Uh, in normal times, retired people can volunteer to help out. But right now is not normal teams, times and older people are, uh, it's too dangerous for them to help out. So you lose your volunteer corps at the same time when you have more demands on the volunteer service. So it's time for younger people and more able-bodied people to pitch in. And uh, that's what we're doing. So I think we have time for one last question. And this is from a viewer who says they've watched every episode of your show and wants to know, are there any favorite places in Europe that you have not yet featured in your show? Oh man. Well, this year I had, this is, if you'll notice this year, if you really know my program, you know, every two years, like clockwork, every, every even year, every, every two years, we bring out a new series and it's always 12 or 13 or 14 shows this year, only eight shows, you know, because of COVID it shut us down. We were going to do two shows on Poland and two shows on Iceland. I was raving about Iceland a little while ago. We have beautiful scripts for Poland and Iceland, two countries I love. Uh, so those are places that are on deck. And then um, some of, you know, the nature of the whole business is you do your favorite places first. Consequently, a lot of my favorite destinations were shows done 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and it's time to go back and update those shows because things do change. But over the last 20 years, we've done 120 shows. So imagine cutting Europe into 120 little slices, um, uh, half hour slices. And if you wonder what are my favorite countries, I like them all, you know, but you could divorce me and you'd say, well, okay, what have you done shows on? And I've done two shows on Norway I've done four shows on Ireland, I've done eight shows on Spain, and I've done 18 shows on Italy. So I've done a lot more on Italy, but 
uh, you know, Jen, one, one thing I like to do with, uh, this is just kind of insider stuff, but this is the Gazette I produce every uh, year for the stations around the country, talking about new shows we're doing and so on. And on the back of it, I have this listing of all the shows we have in distribution now. And that's a lot of travel there. Those are 120 half hour shows, plus all of our uh, one hour specials. And um, I got to remind people that we produce something for teachers and for homeschooling parents and students called Classroom Europe. It's a free service. It's my gift to teachers. It's uh, got no ads in it. It's fast. It's free. It's really fun. And what you do is go to Classroom Europe, or you can just Google that or Rick Steves Classroom Europe. And we took our 100 TV shows and we cut it into 500 little teachable three or four minute clips. And you can, you can search it. If you just type in water lilies, bam, before you type in lilies, you've got Monet, Chevernet, Mamartan, and Orsay, three different clips relating to Monet. If you type force fed, you've got geese and foie gras. If you type in bulls, you've got Pamplona. If, if you type in libraries, like I just did because I was giving a talk for a library, you've got five different clips about the historic libraries in Europe. So it's been really fun for me to offer that to teachers who have a reason to teach this or that. And, and you can type in canals Amsterdam and get that little clip just instantaneously. Uh, and also all of our shows are available also for people to enjoy uh, online on our website and so on. Well, this hour has flown by. Thank you so much to Rick Steves for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to the audience for all of your wonderful questions. This talk is going to be archived on the Vermont PBS YouTube page. And you can catch season 11 of Rick Steves Europe on Vermont PBS Plus and Create or stream anytime from vermontpbs.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Happy travels, even if you're just staying home for a while. <laughs>